Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll. I'd like to once again welcome you to a special presentation of our Classroom on the Air. The topic today is going to be different than what I would normally discuss. It is about the fact that we are not going to all have the same outcome, and a lot of people will not even take advantage of opportunities the way we were told. Again, hi everyone, I'm Gary Nall. I'd like to welcome you once again to our classroom on the air. This is going to be a, a little more in-depth thinking classroom on the air. Why? Because when we look at our lives individually and then as a society as a whole, we see that we're not making a lot of progress on solving a lot of our problems. For example, think of all the young people who are immersed in debt. And we as a society have not done anything to change that. For example, universities and colleges today are encouraging people to take all the classes they offer, but they surely must know that artificial intelligence, automation, transhumanism, are taking away a lot of those jobs, probably as high as 70% of the jobs that many people think they'll have and assume they'll have, which can pay off their college loans, uh, won't be there. To the contrary, there is an enormous tsunami of, of unemployment coming at us. Who says? The World Economic Forum, who's going to be responsible for a lot of it. But they think it's a good thing. They think that it is better to have major Silicon Valley corporations create technologies that allow you not to have to work. To kind of stay in this wonderful euphoric place where you'll just play all day with reality, virtual reality, and, and they'll have such a menu that you could spend the next 20 years not get through all the opportunities they're offering you. That's not a good thing. They also believe that you should own nothing and be happy. That's a terrible thing. They believe that you should not protest being chipped, monitored, having no privacy at all in your life. That's a terrible thing. And yet they seem to be winning because not all people, not even a majority of people are going along with them, but they control the media. They control governmental agencies. They control major corporations. They control the messages that we receive. And if you don't think that's powerful, ask yourself this. Can you find me a single scientific peer review study showing you that eating all the pork we eat, the beef we eat, is good for us, live, allows us to have a healthier heart, live a longer life, is anti-inflammatory? No, no such study exists. I can show you thousands of studies that what we eat, how we live, how we deal with stress, uh, adversely affects our health, our life, et cetera. We can't even get a relationship right. You know, we, we have all these shows telling us what kind of relationship we should have and what we should do. And none of it's real. It's just someone else is exploiting our needs. But they're clever. When you watch an advertisement, do you believe it? Do, does that commercial and drinking some alcoholic beverage does that inspire you to want to have that alcoholic beverage? Eating that really thick hamburger? Does that say, I'm hungry, I want that hamburger? What about the consequences to your health? That's irrelevant. Because if they had to be honest, they would put a black box warning on every television for almost every commercial they have. But they don't have to. They know the consequences. The cigarette companies knew the consequences for 100 years emphysema and bronchitis, COPD and lung cancer, heart attacks and strokes that you would have for smoking and you, the addiction. They knew it. The FDA knew it. But no one did anything about it. So whose interest is it that we make better choices? It's our interest. Now, who's going to make a better choice than you? Nobody for you. So that's why I'm doing this series. I'm trying to take all the different crises we face and show you the truth of that crisis and the solutions for it. Let me give you an example. There's a person who is very popular out there right now, and he says that, and a lot of people also have chimed in on this, that we should all have the same opportunity. 
I agree. But we don't always have the same outcome and we can't mandate the same outcome. Some people, the equity people say, no, we should all succeed. We, if we compete, we should all win an award. Uh, if we go to school, you can't punish the person that does DNF work uh, and uh, because that's embarrassing them, causing them stress, so give them A's. Well, what if they didn't earn the A? What if there's no meritocracy? What if there are no standards? Well, take a look at one school. And no, the entire school district in Baltimore, there wasn't a single student in the entire city in those schools who was proficient in math. How's that happen? Never happened when I was growing up, public schools. We had people from the full spectrum of economics, and but they studied their requirements. There were consequences to not doing the right thing. Today, there's not. To the contrary. So I'm going to respond in this way. So let's just say that someone believes that, that we all can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. You've heard that notion. Work hard. Your uniqueness, your creativity, your originality is just going to explode with ideas, and you should not be hindered and limited in going forward. I agree with that. You should be able to express yourself. But here's where I differ, radically differ, and where it's so important. And what I'm about to tell you has changed a lot of people's lives. But a little background first. I had, growing up, coming to New York City, I had some wonderful personal friends. Like all friends, you hang together, you go out together, go dancing or films, whatever you do but you enjoy each other's company and you're not afraid to tell them what's on your mind. You know, you share these insights because unlike Harry and Megan, they're not going to betray you, right? Whatever you share, they got your back. It stays between you. Well, they were the belief, and I'm now referring to four of them who are psychiatrists or psychologists, and I mean the top of their field, very respect, authors, big practice, graduated from Columbia University, et cetera. And they believed in different schools of psychology. The Freud School, Sigmund Freud School, Adler, um, Jung, they all had different Eric's, Erickson. They all had different grounding that when you came to see them and you had a problem, no matter what the problem, they had to fit your problem into that little narrow paradigm of inside here is all that I know and I've got to see you through this paradigm. The lens I'm looking at you shows me that you've got something that has to do with growing up, blah, blah, blah. But I said, that's foolish. Because that means if I had one person who had some emotional problems and I sent them to each one of you, you would come back with four different diagnoses and four different ideas of approaching it. I said, we're missing something. I said, have you ever actually cured anyone? This was a dinner we had. And they had to be honest, they hadn't. To the contrary, at the same dinner, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They were trading patients. Well, I've got this schizophrenic for the last 10 years. I see him three days a week, charging $250 an hour. Well, I've got this manic depressive. And they were exchanging patients. I said, wow, this is nonsense. Okay. Then something happened that really caused me not to want to help anyone ever again. I mean, literally, just stop. I've been doing a Tuesday evening free lecture at a place that I uh, rented down at the Staples Center, down 81st and Broadway. And it was packed. It held 200 people, and there were generally 250 people because people would stand. And I would go in, my brother and I, Stephen, and we'd do lectures. We'd answer people's questions. One day it might be on food combining. What's the best way of combining food so you get maximum digestion, utilization, absorption, elimination? But there was never stopping the questions. It was supposed to be an hour. I wouldn't get out of there for four hours. After two years, one day my brother came by, as he normally would, and we'd walk down because he just lived up on 86th Street at that time. This was on 81st Street, five block walk. And he says, uh, Gary, I can't do this anymore. I said, what? He said, we're not helping anyone. I said, what do you mean we're not helping people? Of course we are. He said, no, we're not. No, 
Gary, you're confusing your effort with results. You're getting no results, but a lot of effort. I thought, well, that Steve's just a little out of sort today. So we went down there, and instead of me starting it all, he starts it all. And he said, just got a question for you. We're going to go around the room. I want every single person in this room to answer. Tell us how what we've shared with you, you've used to change the problems in your life. And people generally sit in the same seats. Like right in front, there was this woman who would ask me very technical questions. Like, Gary, if an orange is acid and pineapple is subacid, can you eat them together without having a gastric reaction? That kind of question, right? And I would answer it. Always different questions. So I'm watching, and as he's going around the room, every single person could tell something that they learned, but nothing that they had done to change. I was sitting there, and my, my heart sunk. And I'm thinking, wow, Steve is right, and I didn't see it. And when the last person had finished, I, I know now how much protein I should have in a meal, and I realized I'd been having the wrong amount. But did you change the protein? Well, not yet. Two years. That's over 100 lectures. And we couldn't find a single person out of 240 people that had changed. The people were overweight were still overweight. The people were undernourished were still undernourished. The people with depression and anxiety still had it, et cetera. So we thanked everyone, and they left. And I said, wow, Steve. He said, this isn't the worst of it. This isn't the worst. I said, well, what could be worse than this? Realizing we've wasted thousands of hours of our time for nothing. He says, wait. He didn't talk. And about uh, 15 minutes later, he said, okay, now, follow me. So we went downstairs. Instead of turning and walking up Broadway, he walked across the street on the corner. He said, now, take a look in the window. I looked in the window of a McDonald's and every single seat was taken by the people from that group. And the right, right five feet away was the woman asked me all those technical questions. And she, she's got French fries in a bag here. And she's eating them, not one at a time. She eat them like this. And she had this big hamburger, chomp, 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 with a cola in front of her. And she's asking me about subacid and acid fruits, you know, and, and, what is the caloric value of an onion? So I went in and there was a like a little block so nobody could see me in, but the cashier was there and I asked the manager. I said, uh, all these people come in? Oh yeah, they come in every Monday night or Tuesday night and they fill the place. I said, what's the bill come to? So he goes back to the registry. He says, well, it's around $300. I said, okay. So I took out 300 bucks and I said, give them back their money and tell them this was the least expensive lesson that I've ever learned in my life, but the most costly for my confidence and trust in people and human nature. And we left. And I, that's when I was just disgusted because I saw that when people say, save me, they're frequently playing a game, which means, let me tell you all my crisis and problems. Let me master my story, convince you of my story, but I don't have to change. But we'll keep working on hearing my story as if just listening to my story and listening to me being a victim means that I'm going to change. It doesn't. And uh, so I just want to example that today. Where is there a big demonstration against the war in, in Yemen? None. Has there been one? None. What about the war in Ukraine? None. Individuals, yes, but not as a nation. We don't care. What about the 2.5 million homeless children? So what? What about the 200 million Americans who are so poor that uh, they're stressed out and they can't even give you a check for 500 bucks? Too bad. What about all the home foreclosures in 2008 where 20 to 22 million Americans lost their home? About 6 million homes lost, foreclosed on. It could have been stopped with an executive order and a moratorium. It wasn't. The people created the problem, got bailed out. The banks, the corporate interest, average people and small business got wiped out. Where were the protests? None. Where were neighbors helping one another? Didn't happen. 
And I did a document around this called Poverty Inc. I went all across the country, all the all the places where people were living for the first time in their life in a tent out in the woods in New Jersey and Florida, et cetera. And through this whole thing, I kept thinking, what's wrong with the people that they don't want to help those who are suffering? I've come to some answers on that. But in any case, I can show you thousands of examples of where people should stand up and speak out and don't, where people should move out of harm's way and won't, where people should stop bad habits that are self-evident, and the evidence is overwhelming. So you can't say, well, I didn't know smoking was bad. Russian roulette's bad. That's dangerous. My kid does it every day. Hasn't been shot yet, so it couldn't be that dangerous, right? That's the stupidity you hear. The excuses, rationalizations people give you and simply said, stopping saying, hold on a second. This is crazy. Why in the world do we have 100,000 young people killing themselves with fentanyl, overdosing, alcohol overdosing, or taking their own lives? In a year, more Americans kill themselves in a given year than all the casualties in the Vietnam War over 10 years. Shouldn't that be a discussion? No discussion. Don't talk about anything that reveals itself as truth. We can't handle the truth. Jack Nicholson was right in, in that movie scene. We can't handle the truth. If we did, we wouldn't vote for the people we do. We wouldn't eat the food we eat. We wouldn't dress the way we do. We wouldn't live where it's non-sustainable. But we seem to be doing everything wrong and assuming that's normal because everyone else is right beside us. Hey, I'm not the only one living on a cliff in California. All the, you know, DeGeneres just wrote, bought a, a house for, with her partner for $70 million. And you can see from one of the pictures they took, the cliff is just, they could throw a rock and hit the cliff. That's coming down into the ocean. And it did, not there, but others up and down the hole. What causes so-called smart and successful people to make bad choices? Because in the moment they're making that choice, they're neither smart nor are they are concerned about the consequences. So how often are we on the right side on issue? Some people all the time because they think through things. They're not impulsive. They don't act from just raw, unbridled, reactionary emotions. They go to reason. What is the likely outcome if I say this, do this? Now, so I won't go through what happened over the next 24 hours, but it was significant in my life. And it was an epiphany. And you'll see the whole story in a few moments. But I suddenly had an awareness. I had I suddenly understood things I'd never understood. And that's what I'd like to share with you. First, I'll say that I believe that we are born with the uniqueness of a life energy. I have thus far determined seven life energies. So when you see someone building a skyscraper, a whole Hudson Yards complex, you know, building, building a corporation. That's not your average person. These people I call dynamic assertives. They lead the world. I mean, look at the richest person. He is a dynamic assertive. Dynamics see the big picture. And they have the power, the charisma to make it happen. But they can't do it on their own. They have to have other people do the actual work. So on this scale of seven life energies we're wrong with, we can maladapt. So we live a life energy we're not. And we can succeed at living the wrong life energy, but we always suffer from the big empty. We succeed in spite of the fact that's not who authentically we are. The perfect harmony of life is to live based upon honoring your true life energy. Now, all life energies work in harmony. And I'll show you all the ways I was able to prove this. For example, would you ever go to a Philharmonic Orchestra without a conductor? No. Even though every single musician is a master, they're a master of their individual, but they have to work collectively. The conductor that doesn't play an instrument but directs everyone else and knows every single sound and how it should harmonize when it's not harmonizing. That's why that person is that energy. They're dynamic energies. Now, you can be on the upside, the good side, and the downside. 
of an energy. On the upside, you share this. There's harmony. There's peace. There's there's benevolence to everyone. On the downside, tyranny. Look at Stalin. Look at Mao. Look at Pol Pot. Look at even American presidents who did not use their power for the betterment of all people, just their voters. And look at the downside of that. And then why don't we all protest at the same way at the same time? Because there's a largest group of people called adaptive supportives. They make up the vast majority. Those, those are the worker bees. Do you think that you could go and work in a Detroit tire factory, putting tires on cars every day for 30 years? No, unless you're an adaptive supportive. When I worked at Kaiser Aluminum, I always knew a phenomenon. It was down from where I lived in Parkersburg and going to college, and I was a research and speeds analyst. It was part of my uh, business college um, background. And there was a town called Ravenswood. What was interesting about it was all the houses at the bottom, they almost always had a Ford or a Chevy or a car or truck. And if they had a truck, they had a gun rack, and they had the guns in the back on in the back of them. Their houses were, you know, just basic small houses, 1,000 foot, 1,200 square foot. But further up, there were the nicer houses. And when I would go up, go up and down, look up and down the street, they were better groomed. The lawns were kept, there, you didn't have broken fences and holes from the dog dingham, and the shutters weren't torn. I mean, they really were maintained. And then clear up at the top of the hill was the wealthiest people's homes. And they had bigger homes. And they didn't have a Chevy or Ford. They would have the Cadillacs, the Lincolns. Uh, they would have the expensive cars. It was interesting because then I thought, all my uncles are all engineers. And if I went into their garage, every single tool would be on the on on the wall and they'd be painted so you'd know exactly where it goes and they'd have jars of at that time it was glass jars of all the screws and nails and there was no oil stains <laughs> their car ran perfectly it was always maintained they to the if it had to change the oil every uh, 2000 miles it was 2000 miles they would have multiple life insurances and all kinds of insurance they'd have freezers where food be uh, every kind of frozen food in case anything ever happened. They would have a backup generator where no one else did. And uh, they tend to be more conservative. Um, today, we would call them the geeks. They, they, if they went on a vacation, they would generally go to someone's, uh, one of their in-laws' homes to fix their, you know, broken air conditioners. They could fix anything. And you always knew that when something w went wrong, they would help you. So I started thinking, wow, you can't have the worker bees without supervisor bees, and they're the supervisors of life. They're the ones who, they're the ones who actually go in the, go right out where there's a problem to try to fix it. They became the foreman, they became the supervisor, the engineers, and they made sure everything was working. And there was a time when they thrived in America, where everything we did, we did right, from our highway system to the Hoover Dam to these uh, wonderful projects, you couldn't do them. I couldn't do them. And the people who ran America couldn't do them. But they were the ones who made sure that if an airplane was built, the engines worked. They created the safety standards. Now, so you had the adaptive supporters. And the adaptive supporters, they, they don't have a lot of essential needs, just the basics, house, food, security and uh, and then they're loyal and they they tend to have needs like they'll watch television their favorite programs and listen to radio and and they become very loyal to you and that's why some of the older radio programs uh like the uh, the ones on wor in new york they they had dynasties the mccann's patricia mccann who i know uh, was the last of them. I think they were on the air for over 60 years. And the, as you grew older, you just grew older with them. You know, there was that loyalty. 
they weren't just listeners, they were friends. They felt you were part of their family. That's what an adaptive, uh, adaptive supportive, they adapt to the environment they're in, in a good way, and they support it. So they, they supported their whole community. If someone needed help, they would go and help. In fact, I, I, and again, I didn't see it, I didn't see it growing up. Uh, I didn't understand it. I saw it, but I didn't understand it. I'll give you an example. When my mother was the secretary at the First Christian Church, a Baptist church in my hometown, when someone in the congregation had a problem, let's say their plumbing broke, she would call a plumber who would go out there, one of our congregation, fix it, never charge a person. If there was a person that uh, was having a problem with one of their children, couldn't handle it, uh, there would be a call. My mom would make a call on someone else. Maybe a school teacher would sit and counsel the person, see what they needed. But there was always help, and it was always quiet. You know, you didn't make an issue of the fact that someone didn't have enough food to eat. I was the person that would go around and have my mom say, go over to the butcher and get this, and go to here and get that. And one call, and the butcher knew, okay, that person's in the neighborhood. They need some food. Give them food. Wasn't a second thought about it. Wasn't it, well, you owe me? No. Well, let's exploit this. No, it was just people being humane to one another. No one locked their doors. No, no one took the keys out of their car because they had absolute trust. Now, by supporting one another, and you start to see the civilizations that have succeeded have done so by the strength of the family, the strength of society, the strength of the culture working together. So growing up, I saw how people, the adaptive support is how they dealt with issues. And then also how others came and helped them. My mother is what I would call a dynamic supportive, but I'll get to that in a moment. So you have the vast majority of people, probably, probably around 60% of the people are going to be fine. And that's one of the reasons they have a hard time changing. They have a hard time moving, even when the rest of the neighborhood has gone down. Uh, they have a hard time leaving a community that no longer has work. Yet who has been the most exploited of all the energies? The largest group, the adaptive supportives, because they don't like conflict. They don't like fighting because they're in a support mindset. They're there to support the common good. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the common good was not there to support them after the dynamic soul, how they could exploit this, uh, this weakness. I believe it's a strength, but they saw it as a weakness. Think of all the factories were closed down. Where was the protest? It wasn't. Who would close down a factory? Who would buy a factory? Who could? The dynamics. But anyhow, you, you have two I've defined briefly. Then you have a third energy, which is the creative assertive. The creative assertive is the artist. Now, let's just say we had a, we had a formal dinner and we're all in tuxedos and dresses, formal. And at the end of the table is someone dressed like a clown, clown outfit. Everyone's thinking, what the heck is that about? And then someone says, well, they're an artist. Oh, okay, they're an artist. Now we understand. We've always had... We've always had this unique place where we were never quite certain what an artist was as a human being, but we certainly appreciated their artwork and their creativity, whether it's a poet or Norman Rockwell or Picasso uh, or James Joyce, Arthur Miller, uh, you know, Ila Kazan. In any field, you have the person that creates the color, the definition, and seems to do so with in absolute impeccable courage because they're the ones who show up with rally with the posters and the pictures. They're also very courageous. They were not afraid. Think of how many times an artist has struggled for their art. They've spent years working at menial jobs, not getting respect, so that one day they could live through their art. Few actually maintain that, forget there. But it's a very special place be around artists, but they're hard to understand because they go through emotional swings. So if you understand the swing they're going through where their art is everything, 
and then suddenly their need for a relationship is everything. <laughs> and you have two of them in the same year, you can think, well, this person's nuts. No, they're not. That's how they balance themselves. Because if it was all relationship, they would be depriving themselves of their work, which would make them angst-ridden. If it was all just their work, they'd be depriving themselves of the human relationship and the emotional uh, feelings. They're very feeling-oriented. More than any other group, they feel. So you have to take that in consideration when knowing, yet we don't. As a result, a lot of artists have ended up alcoholic or like Hemingway committing suicide because they didn't know where they fit into society. What I'm saying is just superficial what you're going to learn in a few moments. So then you have another energy, and this is the facilitator. This is the person that can multitask. This is the person that is pretty much amoral. They'll do whatever they're told to do, especially if it benefits them. But always working behind a powerful person. This is the adaptive aggressive. And you can be very careful when adaptive aggressives in your life, male or female, because they will exploit you if they can. And generally, they won't be in their life unless they can exploit you. On the upside, they don't exploit you. They facilitate. On the downside, they will. But they don't like being around the adaptives. They want to be around the dynamics behind every dynamic leader in America, in the world. You'll see the adaptive. The adaptive aggressive is the one that gets everything done. But then you have a completely different group three energies. And these energies are essential. They're dynamic. Dynamic meaning they understand the big picture and everything. You talk with them and they have an understanding of what you're saying. You look, they look at the world, they see the world for what it is. They make phenomenal school teachers. They're dynamic, they're charismatic, they have wonderful personalities, but they're grounded in helping people. They're frequently the nurses, the doctors, the psychologists, uh, the the people who look, the sociologists, they look at helping people with the gifts they have. They're very patient. They make wonderful parents. And they're very loyal. You're, you're a friend with a dynamic supportive or a, an adaptive supportive. They want to be friends for life. And uh, they've got great sense of humor. They're, they're wonderful people to be around. Everybody loves being around an adaptive, uh, a dynamic supportive. It's like wearing a well-worn shoe where it's just comfortable. They make you feel at ease being around them. And they're very tolerant of differences in people, they're not firebrands. Then you have the smallest of all the energies, the dynamic assertive, the Ralph Naders, the Martin Luther Kings, the Gandhis, the Malcolm X's. They're dynamic. They understand the big picture, but they're frequently there with the courage to challenge the excesses of authority. And they're the only ones that will do that and succeed. That's why so many have been assassinated. And then you have a group that today we call the elite. These are the billionaire class. These are the ruling class. And they can't be stopped. They have that drive to succeed. So you see some woods. They see uh, five uh, five-acre homes at high price. In a Jersey a countryside, they take over cow farm, and suddenly, a, two years later, it's beautiful development, right? They're the ones who cause that. Look at all your cities. Do you know a single person, regular person, that built a skyscraper? No. No. The single person, the person that actually put it in the mortar, the electricity, the plumbing, uh, the, the foundation work, the crane operators, the steel workers, iron workers, the glazers, those are your adaptive supportives working at the behest of the dynamics. And historically, it's been a very powerful symbiosis. But unfortunately, almost all of the dynamics are tempted to go to the downside where they only care about themselves, no one else. They want all the credit. They want to give credit for the people who actually got the work done. They've never laid a brick. They've never sold a piece of wood. Now, it doesn't matter about their education because I went back and checked myself. Most of the corporate 500 leaders never graduated from college up through a certain period. 
And they're not always the smartest people, and they're certainly not the most humane. So you've got to be very careful because they're the ones who decide where society goes, up or down. And right now we're going down because of them. Just look at all the amount of money they've gotten since COVID and how much everyone else has suffered. Could they use what they made to help these? Yes. That's not in their interest. Should be, but it's not. And then one day everybody caters them. They have a separate set of justice they live by. Now, that's why when I hear someone say, well, we can all pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We can all succeed. No, we cannot. We can all play our roles in the harmonizing of life. So we all benefit. And there have been times in life and society where we have. In fact, there are societies in the world that for two to three to four thousand years lived in perfect harmony. You didn't have one ruler who had the biggest you know palace when archaeologists started looking at the homes they all had nice homes this was in mexico but they're they're all over the world and why we never teach this part of history is beyond me but we don't so the rule is seven energies working uniquely together so they honor their own individual life energy because then and i'll show you how i knew this and th then i'll let this go my friends thought it was just an interesting, abstract, foolish notion. Fine. Just a hypothesis. But I said, what if I can prove to you that I can predict a person's behavior? I can predict the person that's going to go into a war, even if it's war we shouldn't be in and get killed. I can predict the person that will spend more money than what they have and go into debt. I can predict the person that's most likely to have an affair, male or female. Without knowing them, no, you can't. It's not possible. I said, yes, I can, and it is possible. It's a whole new way of looking at life, a whole new way of understanding problems. So I said, let's do this. On this date, I'm going to invite members of my audience to come to a retreat. I'm going to do it at Lake Pakong, where I had a home. And I'm going to invite 20 people. I'll put them in a motel down there, but I can tell you exactly what they're going to do or not do based upon their life energy. They said, that's not possible. If you don't know these people, it's not possible. You can't predict what people are going to do. Yes, I can. So they were there when I, people, everyone came in. You know, it was on a Saturday, came to the office, and I met them. Spent just a few moments with them. That was all. I wrote out a card. I had two envelopes. And I put all the envelopes with the person's name in one or the other. I said, that's it. I said, you have the envelopes. You open them. You're all going to be there. You just you're, don't tell people that you're a psychologist, psychiatrist. You're just going to be there as my guest. Okay. Can't say a word. Can't interfere. Okay. So on Saturday morning, no, on Friday evening, when the retreat was supposed to start, and the bus drove them over, and then they came up. Um, first bus I had get there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And people got to the house. And... Uh, there was no healthy food. I'd taken all the healthy food out. I put only junk food, marshmallows, and <laughs> every bad food you could think of I put there. Salami, bologna, and uh, nothing good. I took all the uh, toilets and just put a sign out of order. I then took all the trash from the neighbor's property that morning, and I took up all the bags of trash, and I put the piles of trash all over the house on the floor. I then um, took the cushions on the couches and I put them up. Now, I was upstairs. Nobody knew this and because uh, they weren't allowed to go upstairs. And so now my friends are there watching this. People, whoa, whoa. Where, where's Gary? Well, this, where's the healthy food? It's all garbage, but they ate all the garbage. And what I didn't count upon, they started going off the balcony, use the bathroom, and my neighbor saw this. Oh, God. Anyhow, I didn't count on that. But then this was that everybody was angry and, you know, let's go home. This is just a fraud. But then at five o'clock, three people showed up two women and one guy. First thing they walk in, what's all this stuff? No, no, we, we, we didn't bring a cereal. Gary had this. Why did he eat it? 
well, there was nothing else to eat. One of the women says, come on, um, let's go down because I saw that there was a store uh, at the end of this road here and we can just walk down there and we'll get stuff. So this person takes two people with her and they go down there, buy all this healthy food, come back and they start making stuff. They get people assigned to make stuff. Then someone else says, look, you're all stressed right now and you're all angry. We don't know why. We don't know what's going on. But, you know, we can't use the bathroom. Why not? Well, it says all, all three bathrooms say out of order. Guy goes over and he flushes. He says, it's working. Takes down the sign. Use the bathroom. Well, what's all this garbage? We didn't put this garbage here. We didn't put this garbage here. It was here. Why didn't you clean it up? Well, no one told us to clean it up. Okay, clean it up. Let's clean it up. 15 minutes later, it's all cleaned up. And then the other woman takes them all out on, on a deck I had, big deck overlooking Lake Pecom, and takes them to meditation, breathing. So they're out there breathing and meditating. And then they all sit down to a wonderful meal that this one person, uh, who was not a chef, but made it was delicious, all healthy. And that's when I came downstairs. And I said, I'm going to thank you all for being here. Uh, you're my guests. Um, it was free, uh, but it was also to teach us lessons, to teach my four friends lessons. I said to my four friends, Dr. Lane Kahn, Dr. John Mullins, for example, open up the envelopes. They opened up the envelopes. And they said, uh, I said, read out the person's first name. Read it out. Hold up your hand. That was all the first group. I said, now open the other envelope. And that's for the three. What was the difference? The difference was that I had to have someone who would organize an environment, who looks for problems. That was the adaptive assertive. And that was the man who was an engineer. And uh, one of the women also organized uh, office. I didn't know this, but she, those three go into any environment. The first thing a dynamic energy does, it creates balance. I live in a community here. I live out in what was the country 28 years ago. It's not the country anymore because people, more people are moving here. And But I have a large piece of land for an animal sanctuary. But I was the only one in this whole area. I enjoyed the quiet. It's still quiet. No pollution. But you just don't have the crime here. I mean, you just don't have it. Petty things. you know. But you don't have the murders. You don't have the, the rapes, the robberies, etc. Why? Simple. You have more dynamic people living here than any place else for population in the United States. So when you have that many dynamics, the first thing a dynamic does, I mean, there's a small town, and yet a person a dynamic built an opera house, and then a big theater where Broadway shows come here, and uh, museums, beautiful museums. I mean, it's impeccable downtown on Fifth Street palm trees, and everything is clean. There's no debris, there's no graffiti, there's no garbage. There's art studios, there's fairs every single week. Just one of the most perfect places in the world to live. The weather's, and the people are nice, not argumentative. Everything's casual, laid back, informal. People want to know that the environment they're living in is safe. And dynamics can cause that to happen. Or if they, they turn negative, go to the downside, then they don't care about the environment they live in. But then you have to have people who understand cooperation, harmony, working together. So once that weekend was over, all four of my friends began to change how they counseled people, not just helping them well, let's go back and were you breastfed, you know, but rather what their life energy, what, and your life energy tells you all the time. What your heart tells you is who you are. Simple to understand this. What do you feel? What do you feel at your heart level? I feel creative, but I was conditioned to be non-creative. Okay, be creative. Nurture them through being creative. What a difference it makes. Anyhow, it's a very complex subject. 
But if you, when I got people to live their right life energy, so many of their problems disappeared. Their depression, anxiety, poor relationships, uh, wrong working environment, living in the wrong place, all that changed because they were free now to live an authentic life, not a superficial life based upon other people's expectations of them. Something different. I realize it's completely radical and you can accept or reject it. But now we're going to follow this with a full documentary. So you can see it in greater detail. I want to thank you. Now we're going to go to the documentary, Life Energies. Have a nice day. Hi, I'm Gary Nall. And today we are beginning a series. The series is called Life Energies. It is my intent in the process of unreeling this information to challenge almost all pre-existing notions about human behavior. It is my belief that one of the reasons we have so many people trying so hard to help us understand why we're depressed, why we're anxious, why we do stupid things even though we are well educated and fully aware that there's a consequence for the choices we make, we continue to make time and again inappropriate choices. I believe that I have discovered a missing link in human behavior. Before I get to what I believe these life energies are, a little background. It was in the mid-1980s. I was doing a series of lectures. Every Tuesday evening, my brother and I, Stephen, would have a group of approximately 200 people at a loft that I rented on 82nd Street in Manhattan, right on Broadway. It was packed. There was never an empty seat. And the people were very attentive. Like the people right now, I'm broadcasting from New York City from a studio, and we have a full house. Every seat is taken. The people had tape recorders and notepads, and the same people came every week. In the front row, there would be a woman who was about 200 pounds, and she would ask the most incredibly detailed questions. For example, she would say something like this, Gary, if I were to have acid and subacid fruits in the same meal, what impact on my hydrochloric acid would that have? And could I eat papaya with mangoes? And I would answer that. And she would dutifully write this down. There were other people who would have the same questions every week. Gary, what about my arthritis? Uh, it's, and I've answered that same question a hundred times. You've got to eliminate this and you've got to do that. Okay, but the next week, the same questions. But you just let this go. This is part of what happens when you get a group of people together. And then one day, my brother said the following. I'm not going to do it anymore, Gary. I said, why not? He said, we're not helping anyone. I said, sure we are. My goodness. You're just having a bad day. He said, no, I'm not having a bad day. We've missed something. I said, what? He said, no one in that room is changing. I said, that's not true, Steve. I said, I'll show you. He said, no, I'm going to show you. So that evening, we walked from 86th Street, where I lived, down to 82nd Street. And before we started the lecture, he said, we're going to do something a little different tonight. We're going to go around the room and we're going to see all about your health. And we're going to start here. And every single person in this room, we just want you, since you've been coming every week for two years, by the way, this is a free lecture. People paid nothing to get in. Tell us what's changed. And I'm standing there watching. And my brother would point to one person and say, what's changed? Oh, I've learned all about food combining. No, no, no. What's I've learned about, you know, uh, vitamins and vitamin C. No, no, no. What have you actually done? And they would look at you with a blank stare. And my brother said, you were overweight when you came here, weren't you? Yes. You're overweight now. Yes. You had arthritis then. You have arthritis now. Yes. You were depressed. Now you're still depressed. Headache, still headaches. And it took an hour and a half to go around the room not a single person in that room could actually say that
that they had actualized any measurable degree or gained any benefit outside of loving the lectures. Everybody agreed, we love to come here, this is so important for us, we're learning so much, but no one could show that they've actualized it. That was something I had not expected. That to me was a revelation. And it was a, it was a lesson. And I had to learn that it is only when we separate the illusion from the reality that we gain perspective of what is real. I'd been living with the illusion that the mere fact that people ask for help and you give it unconditionally all you can, that it was being used. Little did I know that that was far from the truth. This would be important in what we're going to study today. Then at the end of this discussion, my brother said this is the end of tonight's class. Nothing more. They all left. And we started to leave. And he said, wait a moment. So we waited. I didn't know what he was referring to. But about a half hour went by. Then he said, okay, now let's leave. Instead of going up right on Broadway, we went across the street. And right across the street on the corner, uh, he said, look up. And I'm looking. And there in a Burger King was every one of the people. <laughs> Yes. And what was particularly egregious is in the window was the woman who asked the minutia questions. She had French fries in this hand, the entire bag, eating them this way, and a giant hamburger eating it like this. And this is the woman who wanted to know about papaya and mango, if they would digest properly. And I'm looking at this in absolute disbelief. So I went in the restaurant and I asked the, I asked the man, I said, how much did all this come to? He said, I don't know. I said, well, look on your register. So he goes back and he said it was about $260. I took out $300. I handed it to him and I said, refund everyone's money. I said, this meal is on me. I said, this is the most inexpensive lesson of my life and I'm willing to pay for it. I had to learn my lesson. Clearly, they were not ready to learn theirs. And if you're not ready to learn a lesson, then all the information in the world is like someone coming to you and saying, I need water. I need water. I'm dying of thirst. And you go to pour it, and they put their hand over the glass and smile. And they continue to say, pour more water. And you're saying, remove your hand. And they say, what hand? They're oblivious to their own denial process. I've said it before, I will say it again. You can never find truth in illusion. You must first separate out what is illusion to know the truth. Almost all of our paradigms, our belief systems, are bounded by illusion. After I saw this, I realized that I'd been living with illusion. I retreated. I retreated to a place in Arizona for a day, and during the night, sitting alone in the desert, meditating, trying to find out if I've been living with this illusion, then I can't just go on doing this. <clears throat> I also can't go on seeing patients. Even though I did not charge anyone, I've never charged a person. I've treated probably 55,000 people for free. My belief was that I never wanted to have a person say that they could not benefit from my help because they couldn't afford my personal one-on-one -on -one attention. The other side of that was I never met a person that I treated who ever offered to donate any money for anything, no matter how much I did for them, including reversing diseases, terminal cancer, AIDS. No one ever wrote a thank you letter. No one ever came back and said, you know, Gary, you saved my life. Do you have a cause or something I might contribute to? I began to see how innately selfish life is on the downside. Why is it that at the height of the Vietnam War, with 135 million Americans, the most we could get to protest it was about 600,000? Why is it at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, under 1% of African Americans participated in that movement, actively participated? Why was there no national general strike? Do you know what would have happened if there was a general strike where every African-American had refused to go to work? 
Do you know how the America would have come to its knees in a heartbeat? Why didn't that happen? Why at the height of the feminist movement, we couldn't get, with the majority of voters being women at that time, we couldn't get an Equal Rights Amendment and still don't have one? These questions weren't being answered. It's as if no one had the answer. Everyone had speculative thoughts, but none of it made sense to me. Why do some people enjoy working in a factory for 40 years, putting tires on cars every day, and some people wouldn't do it for two hours? How is it some people have the courage to step ahead, walk right out, no matter what the circumstances, and says, I will challenge this? And you look around and say, you kidding? You're alone. <laughs> you don't go up against that industry or that government agency. You're alone. You're a fool. And they say, it's all right. I'm going to do it. And others, others wouldn't dare stick their head up on any issue ever. So one morning, sitting out in the desert, as I'm thinking about what's gone wrong, what was my lesson, I had an epiphany. And my epiphany showed me everything. I suddenly knew in one second of total clarity, as if someone had just opened the blinds of the darkness of my mind and revealed itself. Why we didn't have an Equal Rights Amendment, why we have broken every one of 1,333 treaties with Native Americans, why there are people who will cause empires to be built and others to be destroyed why we will have only a few, a handful of consumer advocates like Ralph Nader, but we have an awful lot of people who will use products even when they're bad. Why we will have only 1% of African Americans supporting the uh, civil rights movement, and why we'll only have less than one-tenth of 1% 1 opposing war actively. Why we will have people who will stay in bad relationships knowing it's not going to get better, and people who will find outstanding relationships and be completely fulfilled. Why one person needs to constantly work and never feel as if enough, and another person takes it easy and feel completely whole by the experience. Everything that had been missing in my understanding of psychoanalysis and psychology and human dynamics and human behavior was revealed. I believe it is the missing link that would completely change all of human nature and how we work. It is called life energy. And in that moment, I saw that we are born one of seven life energies. Now, here's what gets a little tricky. We are born with one primary life energy. That life energy is the core of our being. But because we are conditioned to be things, our personality is molded, our beliefs are molded, what we do, our conditioned response to things, our defense mechanisms, are all molded by the environment in which we grow up. After all, children mimic their parents. They take on qualities in, of the parent. They're a sponge. They absorb that. Now imagine you living in an environment where you have multiple energies all showing you by example and the energy that they extend out and that you absorb in what is right, what is wrong. Well, we've made the mistake of assuming that everything we're taught is right. And if it's not right, how do we go back and correct it? How rare it is for someone to say, you know something, we've taught you an awful lot growing up, but we were only teaching what we believed and throwing in our own biases and fears and insecurities and uncertainties and our own anxiousness and our own angst and our own pain we also threw that in too, but we never challenged our belief systems. We never went back to our priest, rabbi, minister. We never went back to our fathers and grandfathers and said, hold on a second, why should I do this ritual? Why should I do this? Why should I think this way? What if it's wrong? But when was the last time any paradigm honestly wanted to see what in its own belief was wrong? Do you know any? No. No, the only time anyone is even forced to seek what is wrong is when the public pressure is so strong from the outside for its own survival, it will do a mea culpa and take some examination and then come forward and try to rationalize 
why it has done things in the past that were wrong. But on its own, it does not apologize. It does not recognize its, publicly its own limitations because when any paradigm, any institution starts to tell you, you know something, we've really gotten this totally, totally wrong and we need to correct it. You're going to create doubt in people's minds and with doubt people will start to lose the connection. It is with absolute certainty that people are joined at the hip because once you step out of something, it doesn't control you. And once you're stepping away from something, you can see it for what it is. You can see the conflict in Rwanda or Chesnia or Northern Ireland or Israel. You can see it for what it is when you're not a part of it and you go neutral and look at simply the facts. You cannot see it when you're a part of it. You can never see the true nature of resolving conflict when you're engaged in the conflict because part of your energy is defending the conflict, defending the rightness of what you're doing. Whether it's blowing up a bus with kids on it or blowing up a mosque or shooting your neighbor in the head. You'll justify it. If you couldn't justify it, you won't do it. You'll never do what you cannot justify. Remember that. Never will you do what you cannot justify. Whether it's lying to someone, deceiving them, using them, manipulating them, any negative that you engage in, you will already have the justification. And that is a part of the life energy too, the higher low side. And on the low side, every energy has its own unique dynamic. Here is what we have to understand, the overview of the energy types. There are three major energy classifications. There is dynamic, creative, and adaptive. There is charisma in the dynamic and magnetism in the dynamic. And you can't fake it. We've all known of situations where we have walked into a room and someone just we're drawn to them. They could have a bag over their head. We're drawn to them. They do effortlessly what others with great effort cannot begin to achieve. There are those people who can be charming and polite and nice and joyful, but they're not dynamic. Dynamic is a charismatic energy. Like Elvis. Elvis was dynamic. When he walked out on a stage, even if he was overweight during one period, or zonked out on other periods, he was still Elvis, right? Others can dress up like Elvis, look like Elvis, sound like Elvis, but they don't have the energy. And if you don't have the energy, then you don't have it. Then it's an imitation. Dynamics don't have to imitate. They're the real McCoy. Creatives are the artists. They're the ones who have unique capacities for understanding life. They, they can, they're very good at feeling. Of all energies, they express their feeling through their work, whether it's poetry, music, sculpting, uh, writing. They are able to take a whole lot of disparate energies out here, bring them in, digest them, and give you something that you can really associate with. It is the creative that allows us to feel at a deeper level something extraordinarily intimate. And they are unique in their capacity to do that. The adaptive, the adaptive is not charismatic. And frequently, they are self-effacing. The adaptive, however, is absolutely unique in their capacity for sacrifice. When you consider who works in the same job for 40 years and will always be dependable? Who wakes up and makes sure that you get your mail delivered, no matter what the weather or circumstances? Who's always dependable? The worker bee of society is the adaptive. Imagine life without them. You couldn't have life without them. They are the bedrock upon which all social function exists. And yet they're the least appreciated and the least rewarded. What is the difference between dynamic and adaptive energies? One's the conductor, the other's the musician. Imagine trying to play music without any lessons or any direction. Imagine if you had 60 people in an orchestra, each never meeting the other, each 
having a familiarity with her instrument but not knowing what does it sound like in harmony. The dynamic is the conductor. The dynamic is the one that brings them all together and has them master in synchronicity, in rhythm, in balance, in unity, the sound that comes forward. That's what the dynamic is. The dynamic is the facilitator of all processes that evolve. The adaptive is the person who actually is the functionary, the one that actually causes the functioning of evolution. Without the adaptive, you couldn't build a building. Who would be your masons? Who would be your electricians? Who would be your plumbers? But the adaptive has never built a skyscraper or a coliseum. The dynamic does that. Someone who's willing to take the big risk Organize it, put it together. Have you ever wondered, driving around this great city of New York, who, who owns these big buildings? How do they make that happen? Owning it is not the same as building it, but you need both. That's why the synergy is so important. What concerns me is the disparity between what one gets for their efforts and what the other gets for their efforts. The great division in sharing the spoils. Enormous disparity. That's the selfishness of a dynamic on the downside. But we'll get into that in detail. Why is creative energy so unique? Because it cannot be duplicated. If you're not a creative, you can't fake it. You can try at it. But only a creative comes from that place of incredible sacrifice. Unlimited capacity for bouncing back. Who is so selfless that they're willing to work for causes? Every march, every protest, every major movement has to have the creative assertive that gives them their spiritual theme. Who writes the folk music for the Vietnam War? Bob Dylan? Yes. Joan Baez? Yes. Crosby, Sills, Nash, and others? Yes. Who does the art that shows you the images that are most poignant to get people's attention, that's the creative. They feel, they process, they take in all that's happening in a society and then bring back a form, bring back a message that we all can understand. That's why we're moved by their illustrations, their photographs, their writings. I will get into the three subgroups because there are three subgroups, aggressive, assertive, and supportive. The aggressive is the one that gets the job done. The aggressive is the one that is not afraid to get out there and stir the mix. They're the multitaskers. They're the hard drivers. They're deterministic. The assertive does not drive hard but rather tries to assert a particular point of view. They're more philosophical. So their assertiveness is not pushy. Rather, it is looking at something more often than not and asking, is this balanced in its ethics? Is this right or wrong? The assertives, I would say, are the moral equalizers of a society. They're the ones who are saying, should we really be doing this or not? And unfortunately, society rarely listens to them. Martin Luther King was an assertive. Gandhi was an assertive. The supportive does not question because no one listens. They support whatever is. On the upside, that's very positive. On the downside, you have Nazi Germany. You have people who will do anything they're told, no matter what. What does it mean to live on the high and low ends of our energy? This is where you're going to learn a lot. From the high end of a life energy to the low end of the same life energy can be from something spiritual to something demonic. Constructive, destructive, positive and negative, happy and sad. It's an enormous swing between high and low. My interest is in getting you to understand that every choice you make will cause either a high or low. That there's no such thing as just not making a choice. And there's a consequence to every choice, high or low.
And that's why you can be an energy, but enormous difference how you're going to feel and how you're going to be perceived based upon being high or low. And we're going to try to get you to the high end of your life energy. So we have these life energies, seven, and let's go through them. We have dynamic aggressives. They're the people who control the world, corporate America. They're the, they're the 1,400 pound gorillas. Dynamic assertives. They're the people who don't want to see these people control the world. And these are the only group that are going to stand up. These are the alternative leaders who don't want to be leaders, but they are defiant against leadership. Meaning, if you're doing something wrong, it is this energy that will stand up and challenge you. This is the group that Martin Luther King comes from, Gandhi comes from, and others. The dynamic assertive is charismatic. They're asserting their values and philosophy, but they don't want to control anything. By the way, they're one of the smallest percentages. They're only about 1% of the population, 1%. Dynamic aggressives are about 3% of the population. Dynamic supportives are not going to get involved in political dynamics, and they certainly don't want to run companies. They're dynamic by the very nature of their passion for life. They're wonderful human beings. I'll get more into them later. And they're about, they're around, I would say around 5%. Then you have the adaptive aggressives, the adaptive assertives, and the adaptive supportives, and then the creative assertives. Creative assertives are always the artists. The adaptive supporters are your average person, the, the, the worker bees, the masons, the plumbers, the carpenters, the clothiers. They are the uh, orderlies. They're people who care about the society they live in. They're people who care about family and, and basic values. They represent about 80%. Adaptive assertives are very similar to adaptive support in many respects, except they're the techies. They're the ones who love to figure out how things work and make them right. They're the problem solvers. Then you have the adaptive aggressives. These people make great salespeople. Marketing, sales, PR, they're very personable, very stylish. So those are your energies. All working together, you have a perfect and harmonious society but rarely do they all work together. Now let's go through and show you how they all relate. I'm going to do this in the following way. I'm going to go through each one of these points. Let's begin. And we're going to start with the adaptive supportive. Since they're the largest single group of individuals, the least empowered, though they have the most power and they have the most wealth. And could you imagine if they ever got organized what they could do with it. But the trouble is they don't organize themselves. It takes a dynamic to organize them. And if you get a dynamic organizing them on the downside, their energy and power will be used like the mob. And that's happened too many times in history. They're the ones who will go marching off to the Crusades in previous centuries or sack a major city and kill everyone in it. They're the ones who won't question authority. That's on the downside. How does my career look? Do I run the ship or am I deckhand? You're a deckhand. The only ship you ever run is a tiny little rowboat. As long as it's not more than 12 feet long, then you get anxious. Start up comparing your boat to someone else's boat. The adaptive supportive, the one thing that's the heart of their life is their family. They're extremely family oriented and that's a good thing. They don't like a lot of friends. They feel too uncomfortable with too many responsibilities. But what they're responsible for, they really take seriously. They master what they do. They really learn it to where they can do it easily. And no small reason, because they do it so repetitively. They're doing it over and over and over again all the time. Their careers are in every single area of life. There is nothing that can work without having, at some level, an adaptive supportive. They like working in factories. They like working in company, companies that they can work there their whole life. They're the ones who don't like to move. 
They don't like moving their home. They don't like moving their career. They feel very uncomfortable. If there's a strike, if there's a chance for a company to close or be reabsorbed or downsize, they get very anxious. They're easily stressed. And when they get stressed, they end up with heart disease and cancer and uh, all forms of stomach ulcers and constipation because these are stress-related. High blood pressure is a very common epidemic, as is diabetes, because when they're stressed and their life is not fulfilling, the family unit is dysfunctional, their work is, becomes boring, then they start to lose a sense of meaningfulness in their life because so much of the meaning is supporting the environment they're in. So having the support and love of their family is crucial to them being happy and balanced. Being happy with their job, having a good relationship with people at work, that's significant. Being able to know that the people in their lives love them and they love each other, that's important. Having a few, just a few, one or two good friends who will be their friends for life, who they'll be able to rely upon, that's important. If any of that is out of balance, they'll start to manifest anxiety. Now, adaptive supportive frequently first, the men bury their anger, bury their frustration. They're the ones who will work in the mines and end up with black lung or in the factories and brown lung, and you won't hear them complain. One day you just find out that Joe's not in today. He's in the hospital. He's got emphysema. Joe probably had the symptoms of emphysema for a long time. He just decided not to tell anyone. These are the people who are the most likely in our society to become overweight. These are the people who eat to sublimate their frustration because they are the majority of the population. By and way, they're the largest single block. They can sublimate together. They enjoy staying at home watching television. If they do something, it has to be predictable. They don't like spontaneity. They're terrified of surprises. If you said, hey, why don't we go to the Amazon? Uh, no, I'm not going to the Amazon. I'm going to where? I'm going to the Grand Canyon. But you were there last year. I know, and we love it. Now, you may think, well, doesn't that get boring? No, it doesn't, not to them. Because they, everything is based upon security. Every decision they make is based on security. They like to know that there are boundaries. So how does a person live such a monotonous, repetitive life that would bore the socks off most other life energies. Well, we allow them to experience that safely, passively, as a voyeur. We have television. We have a thousand channels. For adventure, for excitement, why do you think we have so many violent films, violent sports, so many adventurous films? Because at one primal level, one limbic level, people will take a lot of their frustration of what they see as an overly narrowly defined life and express their anger through the medium of television as a mirrored reaction. They're not rewarded. They're not respected. So what do they do? In their frustrations, they sublimate. They're the ones who buy the love novels, the erotic novels. They're the largest single watchers of pornography. If you can't have a sex life, watch a sex life. <laughs> Most will go to school, graduate from high school, and then get married. Some will graduate from college, but most won't, and then they get married and have a family. So getting married and have a family, having a house, not a big house, all you have to do is honor their basic needs, and they have the least needs of any group. In fact, if you gave them a whole lot of clothes, they'd feel uncomfortable about it. Sure, they play the lottery, and why not? They're the ones primarily who pay, play the lottery. Of all the life energies, they're the ones who play it because it's the one ticket out. So why not hope, and why not wish? Do I have a staff for me? No. And do I enjoy leadership? Absolutely not. You start giving moldy tasks to an adaptive supportive, you're on a one-way trip to a hospital. You're going to overstress them. They like simplicity. They'll do one thing and they'll do it great. You can rely upon them. They pride themselves in the mastery of what they do. And they are absolutely masters of what they do. But they don't like to do a lot of stuff. 
How do I manage my finances? Is money important to me? Yes, money is important because you don't make a lot and you never will make a lot. Next, how easy or difficult is it for me to manage personal goals? And do goals matter? Goals do matter to an adaptive supportive. On the upside of their life energy, they like to see what they can do as far as building for the future. They care about the future. In fact, I, now when I look back on high school, those students who are always talking about, well, I want to get a job, put in my 20 years and retire. I said, but you're 16 years old. <laughs> you're thinking about retiring? You're not even out of high school. I know, but you've got to think for the future. My dad did that. My grandfather did that. But they're dead. You know, they retired and died. Don't you want to not even, no, no, got to, you, you get your pensions. They had it planned out. That was their goal. They already figured out how many children they wanted, where they wanted to live. They wanted to live close to their families. They, you know, they, they already were thinking about this. And something didn't make sense because other friends were going to go to college. Others were going to go out and explore the world. And when I asked some of the others, would you go explore the world? Why do I want to go explore the world? Wouldn't you like to know what it's like to live in Romania? No, I don't want to go to Romania. I'll get a postcard sent to me by you if you go to remind me. <laughs> well, what about trying Chinese food? I'll go to the restaurant. I don't want to go to China. And then you started to see they were serious. They really wanted a very specific, planned for, laid out life. So goals were extremely important to them. Is city life important to me? Is nature. In point of fact, it's not the city. It's the neighborhood that's important. The adaptive supportive is the person that likes to stay in the same neighborhood and wishes it wouldn't change. Change is a threat to the adaptive supportive. They're least able to handle change because they're the least likely to change. They're the people who will stay in the same neighborhood forever. When they get married, they want to go back to that same neighborhood. And they really resent it when the neighborhood starts changing. I like adventure. Or I'm a homebody. Or what I prefer not to change. Prefer not to change and I'm a homebody. Adventure if it's something like going to Disney World <laughs> and going down the little water slope and going, wee, let's do it again. Let's get in line, but let's have some hot dogs, french fries, hamburgers, Coca-Cola, and that's on the next ride. And then we'll do it all over again. And then we'll go vomit and do it again. <laughs> Do I believe and work strongly for causes? No. Do I leave them up to someone else? Yes. And here's a simple reality. Set aside union strikes where a person has a personal point of view and they're going to be judged by all their co-workers and the dynamics in their own immediate family. The union is a family. How many adaptive supportives are out there protesting the World Trade Organization, NAFTA, GATT, CAFTA? How many adaptive supportives are protesting child labor practices in India and in China, 20-hour workdays in China to make cheap garments? If the only time you ever do anything is when you're forced to do it, when you have no choice but to do it, it's too late because it means that without being forced, you'd have no inclination to do it as a part of the natural process of living. Am I a creative problem solver? No. Do I finish tasks that I begin? Yes. What does my family life look like and what do my intimate relationships look like? Well, it depends upon whether people are positive or negative within their relationship. If they're positive, you've got wonderful, loving, joyful, a lot of fun. By the way, the average adaptive supportive laughs a lot of stuff. Then they laugh at themselves. They've got great sense of humor. They're joyful to be around. An adaptive supportive is one of the easiest of all life energies to be around because on the upside, they're like a well-worn shoe. They're just comfortable. There's a comfort being around them. They don't demand anything from you. They don't demand anything. You can just hang out. Why do you think a lot of guys like to hang out, for example, and watch a ball game? Because no one's asking you to perform anything. You're just being yourself. They can kid each other. They, they find fun in, you know, focusing on the flaws. A lot of people don't realize that that's just a way of 
jostling each other. They know each other, they, but they feel so, they feel the intimacy of what they share is so good, the love they have for each other, that hey, you can just be yourself. You, no one expecting you to change. But they're not also, they're not going to give up any of the capacity to challenge you and make fun of all your weaknesses. And everybody makes fun of each other's weaknesses too, in the nature of their humor. But it's, it's okay, you know, because you're kidding them as well. So they're easy to be around. They're extremely loyal. If you want a really loyal friendship, the adaptive supportive is it. They pride themselves on long-term loyal relationships. And they hurt to the quick and they hurt deep when they've been betrayed. Always be honest with them in a gentle way and they'll respect that. They have the longest lasting marriages when it works because they really believe they should be married till death do you part. And they're willing to try over and over again on the upside of working things out. They don't demand a lot of each other after their basic initial balancing. Here's what I need, here's what you need, let's see how we can get along with each other. And then they kind of, they let things go forward. They're not into deep scrutinizing, they're not into deep introspection, and they're not into dissecting everything at an emotional level. They generally both wear their emotions on their sleeves. You don't have to probe that far to see what they feel. Do I easily create friendships? No. Or is this difficult for me? Yes. After high school and college and the first year on work, you'll probably never have another friend the rest of your life if you're an adaptive supportive. They only have a few and they're long-term friendships. Am I charismatic? Absolutely not. Do I like change? I loathe change. Do I like new ideas? Not if they threaten anything I'm doing or cause me discomfort. What do I worry about the most? If you're an adaptive supportive, security. Your job, being able to be responsible because adaptive supportives are extremely selfless. They give. What gives me strengths to know that my life has meant something, that I've counted for something? that uh, my service to my society has been rewarded by my friendships and my love that they've given in return. Is there a quiet in my life? What does my downtime look like? It's very hard for most adaptive supportives just to rest and do nothing. They tend to keep themselves frenetically busy. The men with various hobbies. Now, when there is a frustration, the hobby becomes all important. Let me give you an example of this. Twice or three times a year, down in Florida, in Key West, in Fort Lauderdale, and in um, Fort Myers, there are car shows. These are antique car shows from the 1930s through the 70s. So anyhow, I'm talking with this guy, and he's got this beautiful Chevy. So I said, how long take it to restore it? He said, four years. I said, um, how much you got in it? He said, about 65000 I said, uh, I don't think it's going to go for that. He said, oh, I know that. I said, I figure it's going to go for around 35000 35, 45000 He said, that's all right. I said, uh, why is it all right? Now, that doesn't include your labor. That's just parts. How many hours you put in that? Oh, I put anywhere maybe 15 hours a week in it. Why? He looks at me and he says, well, he said, it's my place to meditate. My place, it's my world. No one's allowed to enter my world. I go in my garage and I work and I'm relaxed, I'm at ease, and I'm doing something I absolutely love. But then when it's done, there's nothing more to do. And so I got to go sell it, get some money, go to a junkyard, find another old junker, come back and start the whole process all over. How many have you done? I've done four of them. And every single person there that I spoke to that day, about 30 people I actually spoke to, had the same type of story. That car that they were going to give away and lose money on, and not one got the price they were going to, you know, that they had in it. They got their money out of it because they had joy, happiness, peace of mind, and a place they could go, which was their little oasis. It is the intrinsic factor of peace of mind because frequently that's not a guy that wants to sit and watch television. So that's what he does. 
And everyone knows that's where he's at. No one feels threatened by that. He's in his own place. How can I create balance and resilience in my life? By not taking on more responsibilities than what you know you can handle. And adaptive supportive should not be excessively uh, prioritized towards responsibilities that they can't handle. They'll, they'll implode emotionally. Where do I tend to get unbalanced in my life? By getting angry at all the things you feel you can't control. And right now, there is no security any longer in America. Right now, unions only represent 11% of the workforce, where at one time it was up to 50%. Right now, both members of family have to work to make ends meet because you no longer can just walk out and get a $30 an hour job. A lot of parents are working at $10 and $12 an hour at max jobs. And at the end of the day, they're considered working, but they're the working poor. They're stressed to the max. And that's how they get themselves out of balance. Why do others look up to me? Because you are always going to be relied upon to be a good friend, always there in an hour of need, and you really care. Adaptive supportives can't hide what they feel. So you know when they feel good about you because you feel it, and they're not selfish in sharing their love. What positive things can I learn from other energies? How to live in balance without being threatened and not feeling deficient. Now, this is the adaptive supportive life energy I've just explained. Now I'm going to go through the other life energies and give you some ideas about them. And we're working from the largest group to the next group. And that the next group is the adaptive assertives. Now, what, what's the difference? First of all, the adaptive assertive generally doesn't have a whole lot of friends. They're very quiet people, mainly introverted on one level, but extremely capable of solving problems. They are the geniuses within our society. If truly there is one group of life energies that are remarkable for understanding the complexities of issues and how to solve the problems, it is the adaptive assertive. These are the geeks, all right? These are the guys who just didn't fit anywhere else. These are the guys that, and women who kind of uh, were considered a little bookish, uh, sometimes a little intellectual, and almost seemed obsessed of what they were doing, but they always had a knowledge of stuff no one else knew. You know? They were the first to figure out how to use a computer. They, they can do all this stuff. Not only that, but they tend to be extremely organized in how their brain thinks. On their upside, they're extraordinarily neat. If you go into their homes, everything is exactly where it should be, and it works. If they have a car, it works better than your car. It gets better mileage. And they're very social, conscientious about social issues. They're thinkers. They're thinkers. They're deep intellects. They are real intellectual. But they don't necessarily let you know that. They're kind of like the person that sits back when everyone else is trying to work something out, smiling. What's this Rubik's Cube? How can you do this? This is a trick game. And they just go, they got it done. <laughs> then they walk away thinking, OK, give me another challenge. Though the people don't get on television, but if they were, they went on Jeopardy and these other programs. Yeah. These are the people that make sure that whatever is built in America is built right. From bridges and tunnels to aeroplanes. They're mechanics, they're engineers, they're architects. They're the people who have to be there for quality control. They're good people. They're savvy politically also. You'll have a completely different conversation if you went in two houses, one adaptive supportive, well, we're voting Republican because we've always been Republican. <laughs> what about the issues? Oh, you got to stick with your party. And then you go into an adaptive assertive and they'll explain what's wrong with both and why not vote for a green. On the downside, they can get depressed easily because they start looking at what doesn't work in society, what doesn't work in relationships, and they start projecting to it. They start seeing themselves or their own life as incapable of being repaired even though they're in the business of repairing things and they can become erratic, and they frequently manifest temperaments that are bizarre. They become almost, they manifest a paranoia and psychotic, and uh, frequently they're treated for schizophrenia, and a lot of them are on antidepressants. That's on the downside. Now let's go towards the next life energy. So we've had adaptive supportives and adaptive assertives. The next life energy is adaptive aggressives. 
Adaptive aggressive is unique in that they can really get stuff done. They can multitask like no one else. You throw a hundred projects and somehow they're managing to organize all that in their mind and work on them. They're extremely charming. They're very stylish. In business, they're always looking for the next opportunity. But almost everything they do is to get themselves ahead. They're never happy where they're at. And they do not bear fools easily. If you're not at their level, man, they are out of your life. The dynamic aggressive needs adaptive aggressive to get the job done. If the dynamic aggressive is on the upside and the adaptive aggressive is on the downside, you got problems. If they're both on the upside, you get something done and it works and everybody's happy. They're bored easily. They tend not to be monogamous, but they also have a lot of illnesses because when life doesn't go the way they want and they haven't gotten from point A to point B as they wish to, they start to have candida, they have chronic fatigue, they tend to have a lot of illnesses, and they become almost hypochondriac. Everything in life is what it gets them. They'll go to parties that get them in contact with people who can get them something. They're, planner, they're long term planners and they'll scheme to get in the right place. They use people a lot. They become salesmen, saleswomen. They're in marketing and they're in public relations. We've all had experiences with salespeople, haven't we? They'll sell you something, promise you the world it doesn't work, and then they don't know your name. And that's why of all the energies, you really must be careful because there's a lot of them as a percentage. And we have to work with them. It's necessary. And on the upside, they're exciting. They're wonderful. They've got great sense of humor. They'll do a lot of things that you would not otherwise be able to get done. They're also spontaneous. If you said, hey, why don't we go whitewater rafting tomorrow in Colorado? They'll be on the plane with you. Other life energies wouldn't do that. They like to have a lot of friends. They like to know a lot of people. They're very outgoing. They're very extroverted. And they're very aggressive. They almost always get what they want initially because they're willing to push other people aside to get what they want. You know on the Apprentice in these shows, those are almost all adaptive aggressives. I've not seen one dynamic one because none of them are charismatic, but they're all opportunists. Most of your actors and actresses are adaptive aggressives. They're the ones who become mistresses. Have you ever wondered who becomes a mistress? Who would intentionally seek a relationship that is going to jeopardize a person's family and children? An adaptive aggressive. Purely interested in themselves. As long as they get something, that's all they care about. I look at it like this. An adaptive aggressive is like having a Rottweiler. It can be friendly or it can rip your throat out. You better, you better know what you're dealing with. Because if you don't, you will be used. More people are hurt by adaptive aggressives than any other life energy. One on one. They leave the trails behind. They're always looking out for themselves. And yet they have a positive side. It's just so tempting to use their negative side because you know the one quality they have that no one else has? They master their personality before they master their life. And when you master your personality before you master your life, you can con anyone, make anyone believe anything. You can justify everything when you master your personality because the personality is what we go by. If someone seems sincere, if someone seems wonderful, and someone seems interested in us, we buy into it. Be careful. They're needed, they're necessary, they can be good, but it's very easy for them to go bad. And when they do, identify it, confront it, and get out of it. If you don't, you will end up losing. Because adaptive aggressive has to know that they've hurt someone to redeem themselves. Their suffering is only redeemed by projecting that upon someone else. The next life energy is creative assertives. How wonderful creative assertives are. They are the very foundation of all that is beautiful in our society as far as the arts. Every form of art, from dance and sculpting and writing and poetry and 
and, and physical presentation, they make it all possible. They put the color into life. They put the energy into life. Think of the music and how we're moved from symphonies to folk, to rock, to, to gospel. They're the ones who make that happen. Think of the people who make our backyards look special and design our houses so that they're beautiful and buildings that are so unique. That's the creative. A lot are architects. They are unique. They're wonderful human beings. And you know what I love about the creative assertives? There's such a purity of intent. They are selfless. They sacrifice for their art. If there's one group who should be subsidized in our society, it's them. There was a time when I allowed 50 artists to live on my farm upstate New York. I had bungalows and I let them live there for a year. No rent, gave them free food, free electricity, and a phone to use. Just so that for one year, 50 individuals would not have to be burdened by working and then trying to create. They could be in a beautiful environment and create. It was a wonderful year. You also see that sometimes they, they are so emotional that they can get tied up in their own emotions because a creative assertive is very tricky to be in a relationship with, any relationship, because for about six months their energy swings toward incredible intensity in their work where nothing else matters, nothing, uh, where they're just utterly focused. Now, if you're in a relationship with them, you're going to feel abandoned. You're going to, you're going to feel bad. You're going to, and then you're going to say something to them, and they're going to feel guilty. Now, they feel guilty, but they're still inclined to work. But now the work is affected by their guilt. How many artists creep through their pain instead of their, their effervescent self? Then they swing back the other way for six months, and they are so intimate that they're clinging. They don't just embrace you. They're like a squid <laughs> are sucking your life out. All right? There's nothing, there, there's no evenness by any other social norm in how they express themselves. They're very out there with their emotions. They also have the capacity to see the big picture. Well, they're one of the few life energies that actually sees life in its larger context and understands it. They also are extremely hypersensitive. They're, they're the canary in the coal mine for social injustice. Anything that's involving human rights, civil rights, any rights that are being violated, they're the first to stand up and talk about it. At every demonstration, you'll sign someone making the placards and singing the songs. Think of Bob Dylan. Think of all the anti-war movements. Those were people who were using their creativity to address a cause. And today, many of them are documentarians. Thousands and thousands are. They're out there supporting that work because they're wanting to do something of consequence. They're very patient, and they're very good people, though, though you must give them room because they come in and out, in and out, in and out, and will forever come in and out of relationships. And even at work, I would never hire a for full-time staff a creative assertive because they reach a high point, then they kind of withdraw, and then you get them stressed out because they can't, can't create the same way, yet they're expected to, and that's when they start going into diseases. They are the most susceptible of all life energies to illnesses. They get really bent out emotionally and physically. So they should have a period of time when they can rebalance themselves from going from one extreme to the other. There should be a couple months where they can just chill out and, and not be expected to do anything emotionally or creatively at a high level and then come back in. They don't like working for corporate America. They feel they're prostituting themselves. They're idealists, and yet they, they're extremely empowered by their own individuality. Now imagine taking the creative assertive out of society, out of a corporation, out of your life. Think of what you gain by having one in your life. Everyone should be so gifted as to have one or more creative assertives in your life. Everything would vibrate at a higher level. They bring your consciousness up because they don't like trivia, but they love to look at issues. And they're impassioned by issues. They're deep thinkers. These people think through the permafrost of consciousness. They go to the deeper levels of the foundation of issues. That's why when you talk about my radio show, 
I have a disproportionate number of creative assertives listening. Those are the people who would listen to a show that is not afraid to take on issues, that is not talking about irrelevancy. They have a life, they don't want it wasted with irrelevancy. Their creativity is not irrelevant. They're impassioned. They are the heart of a society, and yet they're given almost no time or attention in the respect they are due. Now we go to a completely different type. We're going to talk now about dynamic energies. There are three. Dynamic aggressives, dynamic assertives, and dynamic supportives. They all are very important. Let's begin with the dynamic supportives. You always know you're around a dynamic supportive because two things they have in common. First, they're so easy to be around. It's effortless. They're, they're the most relaxed people. They are, they're fun. They're giving. They make great parents. They're also outstanding teachers. Most of them become teachers. They're charismatic. They also are wise enough to see the big picture. When they look at a problem, they see the totality of the problem, and then they can address it. They're very opinionated, and frequently their opinions are sought out by others because they're the ones who kind of figure out the complexity of life for other people. They're counselors. They make great counselors. A lot are psychologists and behavioralists and sociologists. One side of them, they don't need a lot for themselves. Their needs are pretty minimal. They're very similar to an adaptive supportive in that their home is very important. They don't like to move a lot. They like stability. They're not easy to upset. Uh, they don't come from fear. They have a lot of strength in their character. They come from a certain certainty that no matter what happens, they're going to be responsible, and they are extremely responsible people. They're very compassionate, and one of the reasons we love being around a dynamic supportive is because they try to see the best in us. They nurture it. They make wonderful coaches. In fact, most coaches are dynamic supportives. They're dynamic in that they are able to get you to do what you otherwise wouldn't do. They're able to motivate you. They can be taskmasters because they also see in you what maybe no one else sees. They see your potential, and they're willing to be patient and knowing with guidance, nurturing, and motivation, and discipline, you'll be able to achieve something. Now, here's the interesting part. What they see and create in others, they rarely master in themselves. Generally, after high school or college, their active participation in their own growth process ceases. They don't read as much. They are the most frustrating people in the world if you have them in your family because you see their potential and they don't. Or they're aware of it and don't want to do any more with it. They'd rather kind of hang out and BS and just enjoy life than take it to another level. They figured, why should they take anything to another level when everyone's coming to their level? They're not into arguing and fighting and, and ego. They have such self-confidence in who they are they don't have to compete with people, whereas other energies very much are competing. Dynamic aggressives are always competing. Their whole life is a competition. They never know when enough is enough, but the dynamic knows when enough is enough. They're very good at using their personality to have you believe that they know more than what they actually do. And at a certain point, they stop their growth. It doesn't mean they recede, they just don't go forward, and yet they want others to go forward. They're very much motivating everyone around them, especially their children, and most of their children love the fact that they were giving so much time and attention. They really prioritize well, and in fact, they prioritize almost to a fault when it comes to family. They're very loving to their spouses, to their children, they're very, they're very wise. Unlike a lot of parents that would just argue with the child, they'll sit and explain why something is or is not in the best interest of the child. Not all parents will do that. A dynamic aggressive will not do that. In fact, most children who have, are the, have a dynamic aggressive mother or father frequently feel intimidated by the process, always feel a bit insufficient, and are always trying to live up to this higher ideal. 
Dynamic supporters never feel threatened by their parents' popularity. They accept it. They're just loved. And yet, physically, if you gave them a lot of clothes, they wouldn't wear them. They'd give them to other people. You give them a lot of stuff, they give it to other people. They love people. And they don't separate out people. They don't think because you're rich or famous or, or educated that somehow you have any preference in their life versus someone who's poor. So everyone feels comfortable being in their presence. They have a great sense of humor. They laugh at life. They, uh, they're joyful to be around. Of all of the different energies, they're the easiest to be around. They're the most comfortable people to be around. The downside is that they will get stuck in a place and it just, it's like watching mold grow on bread. Uh, they just won't change. And they can very easily have lowered standards. They're so good with the personality, they can talk you out of anything. you got to let all that kind of go because at the end of the day, they're absolutely dependable. They'll go right with you no matter what it is. And you know what's nice about them? They are so humble, they love to brag about everyone else. They become your biggest cheerleaders. They have just an innate capacity for compassion, love, and defining what is best in another human being, and a very acute memories, phenomenal memories. They're always looking at the big picture. They're great storytellers. Historically, these would have been the people who talk about the nature of culture and the evolution of culture. That's a dynamic supportive. Then we come to the most misunderstood and one of the most challenging of all life energies, the dynamic assertive. The dynamic assertive is the one and only energy that not just sees everything, but will act on it, especially if it is not right. Without dynamic assertives, you have no counterbalance to power in society. They're the smallest percentage of all life energies. They're charismatic. They tend to be very bright. They tend to have a high level intense energy. They don't live by normal boundaries. They don't require the same amount of sleep. They can work forever and it doesn't exhaust them, like a battery that never goes down. Uh, Ralph Nader is a dynamic assertive. They're great advisors. They, they're not good at working with people as much as they're good at working with ideas. It is best to have other energies that take their ideas and work with people. Like if a dynamic assertive were to work with a dynamic supportive, that's a good combination. If a dynamic assertive works with a dynamic aggressive, that's a good combination. They're the ones who are the ethicists within a society. They see what is ethical and not ethical. They're the ones who will challenge. They're fearless. Martin Luther King was a dynamic assertive. They are, they are capable of having people come to them, but the people come knowing that unlike the dynamic supportive is going to make you feel good, Dynamic assertives will tell you the truth. And if the truth is not what you're looking for, don't come around them. They're not afraid of loss. Most other life energies are afraid of loss. They're not. Because they're not great accumulators. They accumulate knowledge and they share it. They have unlimited passion. In fact, what movement would possibly be able to sustain itself without passion? A lot of people are afraid of their passion. A lot of people never ignite their passion. These people are the big generator. They're the megawatts. So people are drawn to them, but generally they do not make the people as important as what they're doing. So their life is more important than the relationships they're engaged in. And if you don't understand that, you'll never feel comfortable or secure in a relationship. You want a really secure relationship? Dynamic supportives will give you a relationship for life. Adaptive supportives will give you a relationship for life. Dynamic assertives, it's tough because they have an excitement in their life that people want to be a part of. But you've got to understand, it's like running a four-minute mile. If you can't run a four-minute mile, don't try to keep pace with someone who's not going to run at your pace. Other life energies, they'll run at your pace. Dynamics run at their pace. And they're always, you've got to always remember, the dynamic assertive is 
pacing themselves based upon what evolves in life. They will have more awareness, more insights into any issue, human nature or uh, societal problems than any other life energy. Historically, they would have been the sages. They would have been the wise women and wise men. They have the unique talent for healing. They are the energy that heals. They are the shamans. They're the people you go to when you want the comfort of knowing what no one else can share. They are not easy at bearing fools. They are always locked and loaded. They're never that relaxed where they're willing to let the stuff go. They're the people who will go out and protest. They're the people who will organize others to make social change. Their whole life is involved in correcting wrongs. Historically, they are also the first to become martyrs and the first to become victims of their own efforts. So if they're not wise in what they do, and if they do not understand how to build alliances and how to go about change, then even with the finest of intents, they end up being sacrificed in the process. Dynamic assertives rarely have the resources to sustain any effort except human resources. And even then, those human resources get worn out in the process. Then you have dynamic aggressives, the final group. Dynamic aggressives are the captains of industry, male or female. They're the ones who see the big picture and see possibilities in all things. If you took a dynamic aggressive for a walk someplace, they just wouldn't be aware of the neighborhood they're in. They'll be aware of what could be done with that neighborhood. You show them anything and they'll see immediately its potential. They're ones who see great potential in all things. They also chronically uh, believe that most people are under-actualized, underutilized, and should be made aware that a greater good can come. On the upside, they evolve human nature forward. They virtually push everything forward. Without them, you would not have any of the major advances we have today. The whole computer industry, teletechnologies, um, all the major films, uh, all of our entertainment, they create that. They create the jobs in the big way. Now, a lot of dynamics get to a point where they have to make a moral decision. Do I push for the big changes through the big picture, or do I settle for something small and manageable? Rupert Murdoch is a good example of a dynamic aggressive looking for the big picture. It's worth billions, creates a whole media empire, influences public opinion, and hires other personalities, hires a lot of adaptive aggressives, that's who you see on television, who then are the shills for that particular point of view. But for every Rupert Murdoch or Donald Trump, you will have 5,000, 10,000 who choose a smaller lifestyle, who don't want to run the world, don't want to be a captain of industry, but they do want to have control over their own lives. They want to be able to see their own dreams manifested, and because they are creative, because they are innovators, and because they're good with people, and because they are not afraid to take risks. And by the way, dynamic assertives and dynamic aggressives are your two biggest risk takers in society. Without them, we would have no new frontiers in any area. They are the ones who open it up for the scientists. And most scientists are adaptive assertives who come in and work in specific fields. What we have today in the United States is we have about, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20 million self-employed people, people who have their own businesses. These people are generally dynamic assertives and dynamic aggressives who have put their life into a more controlled environment. These are people who are on the high end of their life. They're easy to work with. They are more caring about the equality amongst their employees. 
and giving them better working conditions. They are charismatic. People like them. Uh, they're not afraid of risking everything they own and frequently do. And they employ anywhere from one to ten employees. They're the small business people in America. When you add up how many people work for them, you're dealing with about 125 million people. The largest single workforce in America is not your Fortune 500 companies. It's the small business person. Now, when you consider that you're dealing with about, all told, maybe about 8% of the population, that's not a lot. But these are the people that make stuff happen. You go into anyone's business who's got like five employees, they have to be a caretaker for those people. They have to have the ingenuity to create something someone's going to want to buy. They have to create a work environment. People enjoy coming to work each day because there's no separation between levels and floors in a corporation to where you get to a worker. They're all together. Therefore, they have to be right in the mix of this, and they have to be also looking after all their employees and all the personalities of the employees and all the problems of the personality. That all comes back to them. At the end of the day, they're working for everyone else in the business than themselves. Many times they don't take a salary, but their employees get their salary. You'll never see that in major corporations. Dynamic aggressives who run the big picture always make sure that their needs are taken care of. They're the ones who, if they make a mistake, and they frequently do, because they don't have honest people around them, then they make someone else suffer for it. They fire people. Small business people who are dynamic uh, frequently will always have input from the people that are working with them because it's a more intimate environment. And you know that someone's you know, livelihood is at stake, so you get their input. We have nearly 300 million Americans. 300 million. 5% of 300 million is 15 million. All right? Now, you have approximately... 7% of them who choose not to compete because they know that in competing in the high-end, high-stress, very, very confrontational world of dynamics who are on their downside, wanting to overachieve, overbuild, overcontrol, they see that that's going to take a cost on their family, themselves and their friends. So they get out of that. And also for all the dynamic women in our society who felt that they were not being appreciated, which they were not, and who the men felt threatened by in similar situations, but had the power to make sure the woman didn't get ahead, those are the women now who frequently own their own businesses and therefore are beholding to no one except themselves. And that's where they should be because then they make decisions and are responsible for them. And a lot of dynamic men and women, dynamic assertive and dynamic aggressives, realize that we are also spiritual beings and shouldn't the choices they make also honor their spirit. That's why they couldn't continue in working in the tobacco industry or the candy industries or the war industries or the advertising industries. They just couldn't do it. Their own spiritual voice was saying, this is not something you should be in. And they had the courage to pull away from that, to honor their spirit. So the largest single proprietors in the United States are dynamic assertive and dynamic aggressives trying to do something constructive with their life and not wanting to support a larger corporate culture that they feel extremely uncomfortable being part of. Now, those are your life energies, all seven. So what have we learned about our life energies? We have learned that so much of human behavior is predictable based upon our life energy, that the life energy is up and down. And there's a big difference from being constructive, positive, creative, happy, giving, sharing, caring, loving, nurturing, optimistic, up and manipulative, depressed, angry, despondent, using people on the downside. We also know that what determines whether a person is up or down is their own moral fiber and being in touch with their own spirituality. We know that all these psychiatric diagnoses are just off the mark. 
they're really not in existence. A maladjustment in your life energy will manifest virtually any psychiatric label that you want to give someone. But it has nothing to do with the brain, brain chemistry. It has to do everything with getting a person back in touch with their vital life force. So be intuitive. Now how do you know what life energy you are? It's what you feel here. The body is an incredible life force. It doesn't lie. The inner being, the, this, the energy of the cells don't lie. All you have to do is ask yourself what life energy you are and your body will tell you because the energy is there to speak. We just unfortunately frequently grow up being conditioned by our parents' life energy. So if our parents are adaptive, supportive, and we are creative, assertive, now we're trying to fit in to an adaptive, supportive lifestyle, behavior. And that's where we get confused, and that's where we, we go to pieces, and that's where our challenges come because we're trying to do the right thing, we're trying to honor what we're supposed to do, and we feel empty, confused, and we don't know what to do. When we correct the energy and start living the energy we are, I've seen every single thing correct itself. I've seen diseases correct, I've seen relationships, and even careers. Some people shouldn't have the careers they're in. Some people, especially I know dynamic energies, who've been living like they're adaptive supportive. Big mistake. You want to get sick? Under-actualize your life. You want to get sick? Over-actualize your life. You always feel there's something missing. Now, when my brother Stephen said, we're not helping these people, he was half correct. In retrospect, the adaptive supportives who were coming and the creative assertives who were coming to those lectures, they were more interested in being in the presence of a dynamic energy than they were in self-actualizing. So they were getting something from it. They were getting a feeling of connectiveness, the, the sharing the presence. Today, I would say it's okay. You know, I don't expect everyone to change, and certainly not at the same level. I would know who in a room would actually change, who would do a program and do it well and succeed. I know others who would try and not succeed, and I know others who would be there and not try at all. But in their mind, just showing up is trying. And therefore, everyone has to measure their effort based upon that energy that they're at. So it makes sense of everything now. I mean, listen to this. All of our family went to the same school and had the same teachers. We all had the same input from our parents. Then why did we have such different ways of viewing life and acting? There is no mechanism in psychology and science to differentiate our personalities and our life energies, which were our personalities from the environment we came. Theoretically, if you have all the same input, the same education, the same friendships, the same parental input, you should all turn out the same. You should all be the same. But we're not, are we? That is one of the most important points about life energy. All things equal, and yet they're different. The life energy is the difference. I want to thank you all for being here. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you would like to stay updated and see more content, you can follow PRN on Twitter at live.prn and YouTube at Progressive Radio Network. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you again for listening to PRN, the home of progressive voices.